everyone, and thank you for joining me. I'm Tracy Harris, and this is At Home in My Head, the podcast that explores life in the cottage at Woodland Corners. So tonight I am so thrilled to have with me again, Jen Peoples and Phil Session. And we are hanging out for the happy hour evening to have a chat about ongoing crap before the election. (laughs) Hey, Phil. And hey, Jen, how are y'all doing? Hey, good. How are you? I'm great. Phil? Doing well. Doing well. Just chilling out this evening. I, I'm not great. I'm actually concerned about these elections. I have concerns, especially as the polling's coming in in some of these states like Arizona, and it looks like there might be some Republican sweeps. It's a little bit frightening in light of some of the trends nationwide and hoping that voters will turn out for a midterm non-presidential election cycle. I think that's going to be a lot of the key there is for people to actually understand that this can have big ramifications, even for the next two years, for the remainder of Biden's presidency, what things actually get passed, if things just go to a standstill, because there's so many issues that are currently hitting the recent Supreme Court decisions, quality of life, the increase of prices and the lack of help, especially in Republican states. is no guarantee that even if Democrats maintain their control, that huge things will happen. But the prospect of nothing being able to go through hitting this gridlock where it's just everything is stalled, we can't afford things to stall. And I did like that Biden stepped up and took even small initiative on student loans and also marijuana possession. Oh, yes. Yeah. Presidential power is limited and Congress has acted. They've passed some legislation as well. But it is nice to see the president moving forward on initiatives that do not require congressional support. That student loan, that was a very welcome thing. I mean, I would, of course, would have loved even more, but that piece is a huge burden off so many around the country, like just so many. It's, I mean, it's one of the reasons where I kind of stopped looking at even pursuing education even further. Like I put that off to the side because I'm like, I have all of this debt from the undergrad side. Like what the heck am I going to do compounding that with something even more? And so I put it out of my mind for so long. Things have changed a bit, which is amazing for me. I hope to start going to graduate school and starting that process next year, hopefully if everything goes well. But that's such an amazing burden for a piece of large chunk to be lifted off because it looms there on every credit report that I run and everything else is sitting right there. In fact, it was going to be there for another 10 plus years until I reached that 20 year cutoff. But whew. I have been describing it externally as not enough, but needle moving right direction. I'm glad that the needle is moving that direction. I fully support pushing for more. I'm not saying like, oh, good thing they did a thing. Time to move on to something else and forget about it. No, I understand that more needs to be done. Mm -hmm. But I also understand that we have a party that is upset that the needle moved at all. And we have a party that will move the needle. So I'm going to support the party that moves the needle. I'm going to keep pushing and working for more. You don't have to be satisfied and say that it's enough. I will support continuing to push, but you either continue with the party that is willing to move the needle or you continue with the party who wants to pull it back. And I think it's important to acknowledge that a lot more needs to be done. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, right in the aftermath of this, I was following what was happening on Twitter and there were so many people that were piping in saying, I just checked and my entire student debt has been wiped out. This is a life-changing event for me. Mm-hmm. Man, this is huge for so many people. And at the same time, there are so many people that need much more. So yeah, moving the needle in the right direction is huge. If we keep the needle moving in that direction, then we have to support the party that will do that. Like the possession thing, it was federal level charges because that's where they had the power to do that. You have to work, I guess, with the party that is going to move and the party that's going to try to stop the momentum altogether and push it backwards. I just can't go that direction at all. The thing about it is it's like, okay, yeah, there's not that many people that are affected by Biden taking action on the federal level. I think it was Um, like 6,500. 
because most of the people that are dealing with marijuana charges are dealing with state charges. However, if something like that signals to the states that you have political cover to do what you need to do on this. If you want to enact a similar policy and just basically wipe out these marijuana convictions, here's your political cover to do that. You've got one party signaling to the Nazis that it's okay to let that Nazi flag fly, and the other party signaling you now have political cover to wipe away marijuana convictions. So which one are you going to support? Definitely a a stark difference there and the direction of Biden to start examining the placement of marijuana as a Schedule One drug, which of course stops federal funds to be used for Mm -hmm. research to, we have to study these things and see what those effects are and see what where things can be applicable. And it's one thing to have private people funding research in limited capacities or some public involvement on the state level that's approved in small batches, but to have the possibility of federal health funds, that type of research that we pour out research money to a lot of these pharmaceutical companies for all kinds of drugs, this is something that we could better understand to see what those effects may be if we need to change things to better regulate it or whatever else, but it needs that research, at least that availability of that research and getting it off of schedule one would go a long way towards allowing that to happen. It may still be slow moving after, even after it's removed, but that's a heck of a start uh, Mm -hmm. from where it's been. In light of this whole election thing, I wanted to bring up a conversation I had with one of my neighbors here recently, another white woman. And I live in a, I guess you'd call it an upper middle class neighborhood. And when I moved here, my wife and I knew that we wanted to have a kid and we didn't want the kid to grow up in a lily white neighborhood somewhere. So we picked a community that was racially mixed. That doesn't mean that we don't have conservative white people. And so this woman, I happened to walk by her house when she was putting up Halloween decorations. And I saw that she had a sign out front that said, Mothers Against Greg Abbott. And I commented that I, I like your sign. And she's like, oh, thanks. I decided in the wake of Uvalde that I had to get one of these. We started talking and I found out that she was a lifelong Republican, still considers herself conservative, although I I didn't get a chance to delve into what that means to her. But at one time, she even worked for Jeb Bush. So she's not, oh yeah, I'm conservative, but she was like on board. She made some disparaging comments about the Republican Party's current obsession with banning trans kids, not on board with banning trans kids from sports. She still considered herself a conservative and she still considered voting for Republicans, but the Uvalde thing was the line in the sand for her because she's got three young children and she has to send them to school every day. She basically has to think about this every day. And she was talking about, there's law in Texas that said, I think it's every child seven and older has a right to get stop the bleed training so that they can respond to a mass shooting by stopping their classmates from bleeding. And she's like, why should a child have to deal with something like that? This kind of thing has been a real eye opener for a lot of people. Talking to people like this, it makes me feel like there's an opportunity here for people who have always been knee-jerk conservatives to re-examine some of the things they've assumed about Democrats, liberals, whatever, and kind of rethink their views. And it seems like she's further on that path than even I would have expected her to be just based on the Uvalde response. But that was the tipping point for her. She specifically said she's voting for Beto because she feels like Beto has a better plan for how to deal with situations like Uvalde to prevent those kinds of things. She does not feel like private citizens need to have access to. She made a good point that most of these mass shootings, it's not somebody targeting specific individuals. It's an act of suicide. And they're using the mass shooting as a way to basically make sure that somebody kills them. I feel like it's my obligation to have these conversations with fellow white women, because frankly, in Texas, we are the problem. Nationally. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, we're like number two, number two in the Republican Party. I mean, we've got the backs of the conservative white men more than anybody. As long as the Electoral College exists, if we can make a difference in Texas, then we can make a difference nationally. It's a very yeah. small part. I vote. I voted for Beto against Cruz. I will vote for Beto oh, against yeah. Abbott. It, 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 any anything he wants to run for, I will vote for him against any of these Republicans in office yeah. in Texas. And speaking of 
Republicans in office in Texas. Phil, you've been looking at the GOP Texas platform. I'm sure the national side has a platform, but, you know, I'm looking at texasgop.org, you know, slash platform. It's, it's just right there. And there's a 49 pager for you to rummage through. But some things are not a surprise. Given the state of where things have arrived here now recently with the Dobbs decision by the Supreme Court on the third page. So this is just in the principle. So this is just line four of that platform, even with everything that's going on. This is right under number three that says the laws of nature and nature's God. We, we, we support the strict adherence to the original language and the intent of the Declaration of Independence and to the Constitution of the United States. Now, when they say original language and the intent, I'm not sure where slaves factor into there, but I assume that that's not what they mean. Of course, that that's not. Uh, we, we wouldn't, of course, go there. But the number four line says the sanctity of innocent human life created in the image of God, which should be equally protected from fertilization to natural death. What's happened after, as a result of the Dobbs decision from states that have outlawed abortion right out that either had a trigger law or were very you know, happy to get into their legislatures to pass either a total ban or a near total abortion ban. And so you now this is a list that's taken from this is from the, the New York Times tracker. Uh, where they're looking at states where abortion is banned and right there on it you know, are states, of course, Texas is right there in the front, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia has a six week ban, Tennessee, Kentucky, West Virginia, you know, you the whole Bible Belt. For people that can get pregnant, their options are limited right out the get go. You have other provisions where if you have a miscarriage, you could potentially be scrutinized. If you're using drugs or something like that, it's depending on the laws of your state, they can come after you. This kind of line sitting in the platform, knowing that that's the reality that affects so many people around the U.S. It's not surprising, but it's just like, wow, like how have we gotten to this point to where this is sitting right here on their platform to say, this is what we want from fertilization to natural death. The part that annoys me is when you're talking about, you know, from fertilization to natural death, well, what happens all in, in between time? If this is your platform, this is number four on your list that you've got here, then where is that support for those who are pregnant when they don't have access to prenatal care and they want it, but they don't have access, whether it be money, whether they be in a desert kind of situation where there's nothing around them, similar to food deserts where you have to travel fairly far to actually get access to adequate nutrition. What does that actually mean? And are they even caring enough to actually do something about that? But no, that's not a part of the plan. It's just having the child. That's where that support really ends. And there's not even really support there. It's just, you need to have this baby. There's no getting around it. Even if you leave to go somewhere else, like I said, depending on your state, there's so much around this issue. And it it really pisses me off. Oh, but, oh, but, but <laughs> like, that he'll he'll provide baby supplies to oh. women. Yeah. Well, I mean, we had what was it? Uh, Abbott said he was going to end rape, right? I mean, we have oh a governor, goodness. and and in my head, it's like if you could and you haven't until now, that's immoral. Right? right? What the if hell you, were you doing you had, before? If you had the magic to do this before and you didn't, then you're an immoral person. If you couldn't do it before, then what's your plan to do it now? And the fact is, nobody, mm. nobody believes that line. Even saying it is so ridiculous that it's a slap in the face to people. One of the things I have been just really hammering is that these no exceptions laws mm. prove loud and clear and beyond a shadow of a doubt, this never had anything to do with personal responsibility right. or you had sex or you should have kept your leg closed or you should like all of these shaming things that they try to do to say you knew this when you became sexually active it's like the moment you say no exceptions what you're saying is this has zero to do with whether or not you were a participant in the sex right it doesn't matter if you participated or, or if you were coerced you are still going to be forced to have this child if your argument is that it's a personal responsibility issue, then the no exception clause makes no sense. So 
every time I see somebody arguing from a standpoint of you knew and you agreed to this, you had sex. Well, first of all, I don't think that that's valid. But Mm -hmm. at this point, I am not going to argue with you about that anymore because you have already shown your hand and you show that this has zero to do with personal responsibility. And it is a hundred percent about controlling AFAB bodies to try and force those people to have children because you have your own agendas here. And a lot of them have been said out loud. They feel like they need more consumers to be birthed, more workers to be birthed. They're concerned about replacement theory, right? That if we don't make more white babies, what's going to happen? I've Mm -hmm. even seen some people online, white women amplifying other white women to try and push this as the racist issue, where if we allow Black women to choose, we're somehow engaging in eugenics. I can't make this clear enough. The time of cishet white men in control telling Black women what their reproductive reality is going to be should have ended long ago, should not be going on today, does not need to be re-implemented. White women have their own issue here. It is totally a separate context. But the context for Black women, white people need to STFU about what Black women need to do as far as their reproduction. It is up to Black women to make those decisions. They have lived long enough in the shadow of white men dictating to them when and whether they have children. Yes, thank you. And are fully capable of exercising that, provided that it is even their choice to be able to do so, which is what you know they're aiming to take away, which has been in Texas as one of those total ban states. But you know, one thing that you had mentioned, Tracy, about if you made the choice to have sex, you know, these essentially are the consequences. And that's kind of where a lot of Republicans can lead in these legislatures when they're, you know, on their monologue and soapbox talking about why they want to pass these draconian laws. But that takes me to another piece of the Texas GOP platform down at 105 when they talk about sexual education. Here, it says that, quote, we demand the state legislature pass a law prohibiting the teaching of sex education, sexual health, or sexual choice or identity in any public school in any grade whatsoever or disseminating or permitting the dissemination by any party of any material regarding the same. When it comes to you know, all the things they talk about being pro-life, supporting the familial units and everything else, it does not jive with how they're pushing to teach children less. There's been some progress that has happened. So this is from an NPR article that was made uh, earlier this year entitled, Texas Got a Sex Ed Update, but Students and Educators Say There's Still a Lot Missing. Well, one of those quotes that stood out to me was this one. After more than two decades, the Texas State Board of Education is finally catching up. It has updated the health curriculum, including sexual health for elementary and middle school students. The new curriculum, which will be taught starting in fall 2022, includes detailed information about birth control and STIs for the first time. But, you know, and it skips a little long, despite the state's high teen birth rate, a recent policy change by Texas leaders made sex education opt in rather than opt out, which means some kids might not get any instruction in schools at all. When they leave those kind of choices to the board of trustees that are on these independent school districts that are around, if you're in a progressive side of the state or you have a fairly sensible population there, you may get sexual education here, but this other side that's controlled by more conservative uh, members, well, you know, you know, we're not going to do it here and we're not going to do it there. So you have this huge patchwork of people that are not getting well educated about the ways of protecting themselves from pregnancies to go into what those options are for different kinds of birth control. We're taking away that educational aspect. And yet they're talking about when they're in here passing these laws that if you have sex, then well, then you knew what could happen. But by the same token, you're actively taking away that information and making it so that it's not required education in schools so that they can actually be well-informed about their bodies and what the sexual contact will mean, how to protect themselves from certain outcomes when they engage in sexual activity. Because Texas continuously ranks one of the highest among teen pregnancies across the state. 
This is coming from the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention. This is from data coming from 2020, which is the most recent data. But I read off those states earlier that where abortion was banned just across the board. Texas, Oklahoma, Arkansas, this Bible Belt. But when we look at states that have the highest teen birth rates, number one, you have Mississippi, then Arkansas, Louisiana, Oklahoma, Alabama, Kentucky, Tennessee, West Virginia, and Texas at number nine which are all states where abortion is now banned across the board. When I look at these policies of what they're talking about as being pro-life, I see it as probably the most hypocritical shit that I've seen from them because you're not concerned about pro-life. You're, as Tracy said, you're concerned about control and exerting that control over people and even taking away complete sexual education and comprehensive sex ed so that people could make a better choice about their own sexual lives. And even that is too much. We can't have that. It, just, it has to be opt-in by the student's period or guardian if the ISC even allows it to be taught there. So you have all these hurdles to get that sexual education versus making that open so that people can make a more informed choice. It's an amazing thing to watch in real time. I wanted yeah. to circle back before we proceed with this conversation. And just hit real quickly on that GOP platform, one issue that I wanted to make sure that we mention, I want folks to understand what they're saying is they want to police a uterus even before a pregnancy has occurred. Yeah, right? fertilization it, is not conception. Conception right. happens when it's implanted in the uterus, which is days after fertilization occurs. What they're saying is fertilization is where they want to start the protection. Mm -hmm. And this is prior to a pregnancy. We're not even talking about abortion at this point. Banning abortion does not protect and defend life at fertilization. So you're talking about taking a step back before the pregnancy occurs and policing that and saying if there is a possibility of a fertilized egg existing in that space without a pregnancy having even occurred, they want to police that. A lot of those fertilized eggs just expel yeah, the themselves. Thing, the other thing is there's this common misconception about how the most effective forms of birth control actually work. There's a, a myth that goes around in right-wing circles that the pill prevents implantation, and that's a theoretical possibility with certain types of birth control pills, but in reality, it prevents ovulation. So there isn't a fertilized egg. There's no egg that gets released. And there was even, I can't remember what candidate was claiming that for women who had a uterine, you know, an IUD, that the uterus was like a graveyard of all these dead fetuses. For whatever reason, it prevented implantation, and that's not true either. The most commonly used IUDs actually prevent ovulation. In fact, hormonal IUDs for most women will actually stop them from having periods, which again does not mean they're pregnant. It means they are not ovulating. A medically accurate sex education class for these legislators who are writing these bad laws would correct a lot of the ignorance. But of mm -hmm. course, they're not interested in not being ignorant about these things. Not in their interest at all, no. it seems. And people will fight it tooth and nail. It's, uh, my sexual education, I had one in, I remember in eighth grade, and then I remember one in high school. And it was primarily, we're going to show you a video. And they showed us various sexual organs and the effect on them after some disease had taken hold. Yeah. So an SDI. <laughs> And so you had the herpes, you, you, we had several pieces and you saw in graphic detail, you know, this is what it looks like. And all the music, all the imagery, everything around it was to scare you away from having sex at mm -hmm. all. No talk about, you know, well, hey, you know, if you're going to have sex, you know, you should use a condom to help protect you against either transmitting or receiving this sexually transmitted infection. Like those basic pieces where it can kind of guide people through, like talking about what dental dams are and what they do. Mm -hmm. It's little things that could help stopping the spread of these woe is me videos that they were showing us, which was basically all the sexual education was, was a variety of videos, no less, featuring that. And talking about abstinence is the only way to ensure that you don't get this. It's the only way to do this versus understanding the reality based on our teen pregnancy rates, of course, in the great state of Texas, 
that this is happening. And that platform of abstinence only education has been here for so long. And what has been the result is Texas being on that top 10 list of teen pregnancies for who knows how long. Right now we're at number nine. So we're not first. We're not Mississippi. So yeah. I yeah. guess they're saying something. <laughs> Look at, look at the repeat teen pregnancies. And oh, yes, yes. We're not number nine. We're way up there. We're way yeah. up there in the rape rates, too. That's really yeah. high here in Texas. And that's why when you have Governor Abbott claiming that he's going to eliminate rape, what I hear when he says that is that he's going to define it out of existence, which is a very different thing than actually ending rape as a thing. It does make you wonder what is his thought about what constitutes in his mind an actual rape. If you're walking down the street, but you're wearing something that someone somewhere could construe as a sexually attractive attire, and they decide to act on that, is that real rape or is that were you asking for it? And so that or you know, partner rape in his head, it's like, well, you've had sex with this person before, so clearly it's okay. If he doesn't respect your consent to use your body with regard to abortion, does he really understand you are a human being and that consent to use your body matters? I'm convinced that they don't understand consent for one thing and they don't care. They don't need to care either because they just keep getting elected. Phil, you had some local stuff. I've been very involved in Austin with those experiencing homelessness for quite a while. I took over as coordinator for Austin Atheist Helping the Homeless back in 2015. We've seen so much growth out there, not only in the amount of people that you know, we serve, but a lot of the people that are willing to come out and volunteer and actually try to make a difference. When COVID happened, it was a shock to the system when people didn't go out there. We decided to keep going out there. Even in April of 2020, we were we were the only one that we saw out there. None of the other organizations that we're normally accustomed to seeing were out there. We were the only ones there. And we really saw what that had done and the desperation that was on a lot of people's faces when we were out there with, you know, our bags of food and such. But, you know, one of the things that's come up time and time again, you know, we, we have special things around wintertime, which will be kind of gearing up for now and the fundraising for, for stuff like gloves and hats and stuff like that during the winter times and doing special things during the summer, you know, whatever else, but a constant that has been in our informal polls that we'll hold about maybe three or four times a year with people is we need to get on the bus. We need to be able to ride the bus. It sounds small. What does that mean, a bus ride? It means someone can go to their caseworker and have a conversation about where they are in the wait line to get a housing assignment or to go to a NGO, you know, a, a non-government organization who's helping for obtaining an ID, for instance. So if you want to get a job, a lot of people will say online, I see like, oh, well, they can just go get a job. Well, if you don't have an ID and you can't prove your citizenship, well, that becomes very difficult. So there's several places that will provide that, but only certain days of the month. It's only maybe two days and you have to travel to get there. And then they have a capacity. So once you get there, they may run out of capacity and say, hey, we're done this time. You have to try us again in a couple of weeks and maybe we can do it, let alone people that actually can get a job, getting back and forth, getting to addiction services, recovery services like Recovery ATX or provided by Integral Care. All of these resources that are around, but are not necessarily walking distance. Imagine that, that you're sleeping on the streets, you're in the sidewalk or in the brush as Prop B has kind of forced people to recede further and further away from the city center or risk getting their property seized by law enforcement personnel. And that's what Prop B did and is doing, to be clear. But being able to get around to all of these services, if you don't show up to an appointment to your caseworker, it may be hard for you to get that housing assignment. If one was ready for you and you miss it, you miss that appointment that you're supposed to show up for. You couldn't get there in time. It took you too long. Whatever that happens to be, you may miss that housing assignment and have to wait then for the next one to come around. So back in 2019, we started looking into how we can do this. We partnered with you know, a local nonprofit and we started off with just giving 200 we gave two one-day passes to 200 people, so 400 passes total. And these were just one-day passes. And it was huge. You know, the reaction was like, oh, wow, I didn't expect this. And oh, that's awesome. And as I said, this is just for two days. 
it caused quite a stir. And we all saw it because this is the first time we had done it. It was quite jarring to see it. But then just a few months later, this was in May of 2019. In August 2019, we went out again, this time with 200 seven-day passes. So we were giving out one per person. And we were hit with overwhelming emotion from people to be able to get this week-long pass, which, as I say again, that's not a lot in the amount of days you're getting, but that means a heck of a lot to folks that are having to scrounge or ask people just for enough money for the dollar $25, $50 to get on the bus for a one-way pass to get somewhere and not knowing if you're going to get that to be able to go to that service or go see the caseworker or get to your recovery service or whatever things they need. Beginning in September 2019, we started giving 231 day passes, doing that every three months. That translates into 33% of the year, their travel would be covered. And so even at half off with the discount pass program with Capital Metro, who's the local service there, that comes to a cost of 16500 a year. That is half off at that price. It's not a cheap thing. And so we've been talking with other providers for a very long time about doing something more. And there's been a lot of work that's been happening in the background with like Sunrise and other larger organizations to start moving that needle. Just a couple of months ago, this was in August, Capital Metro's board had a board meeting. It was completely filled with service providers, folks that are experiencing homelessness actively right then and there, people that formerly were experiencing homelessness, organizations like Austin AHH, Sunrise, LifeWorks, lots of different folks were at the table. So, I mean, the seats were full. I attended virtually, but I could still see into the room and see the amount of people and all the signs and all the things that were there. We flooded this meeting and they gave us several hours the chief of the board, he wanted to hear from everybody and made that very clear and gave several instances to say, if you haven't signed up and you need to go sign up so we can get your name on the list too. So that was very encouraging. But you heard story after story from organizations like Austin AHH talking about how much it costs, how hard it is to find people, you know, Prop B push people in the back. We have people that go out into the wooded areas around Austin. We have trolleys that we will cart around out there in this terrain, you know, somewhat dangerous terrain in some cases to find people that are living further off the grid because Prop B has forced them to move away from the city center to give them food, water, and a bus pass so that they can try to get around and try to exert more control over their circumstance. As a result of that meeting and uh, lots of meetings with Capital Metro staff that have happened over the last couple of months, we finally got a response back. Uh, the Transit Empowerment Fund that helps to give passes to people like at a discounted cost for nonprofits to be able to distribute passes to people that are low income and that are experiencing homelessness. I'll read from the announcement that they sent us here that the Transit Empowerment Fund is currently accepting emergency abbreviated transit pass applications through October 20th. So they open it up for a period of 13 days from October 7th through the 20th for organizations like mine and others around Austin to send in how many passes they could reasonably distribute over the course of the month. It wasn't just something that was a, you know, a temporary problem where it was just like, okay, we'll do some passes for a little bit. And then that'll be it. We've gotten a lot of encouragement from members of the board during that August meeting that really voiced that, number one, they didn't know that this is such a big problem, that they were committed to doing something about it. They wanted more information so that they could figure out how to do it. It was very encouraging to see so many board members actually listen to the community and say, okay, we've got to do something. You know, listen to us for over, it was like over two hours, I think, <laughs> of testimony from all of us. So there's a lot of us, and that was limited to about three minutes per person. They'll be giving out these passes to organizations to assist low-income riders over the next four to six months while they work on the permanent long-term solution. And if that solution comes to full fruition, as we talk with them about, you know, different ways of doing it and looking at other cities, what they've been implementing, it could fundamentally change the lives of tens of thousands around Austin for those that were experiencing homelessness to those that recently got housing assignments, but they're still low income because those, they need a lot of help. Just our group, Austin AHH, since 2019, we've given out 74,650 days of free travel. 
in the course of about three years. It's been a huge help to people all across Austin as they start moving through the process of getting towards that housing. It was one of those small things that it actually worked out. They're still not fully there, so I won't, you know, count my chickens yet, you know, before they roost or whatever the the saying is. (laughs) But to get that reaction from the board, to get this temporary measure that's going to serve for the next four to six months as they work on, you know, longer term solution that can truly make a difference in people's lives on a permanent basis going forward, saving organizations like us the need to have to look for funding to fund such a huge cost. You know, it greatly exceeds our cost for food, for example. And that's our main program, of course. It was food and hygiene, and all that kind of stuff. It easily gets right over that. And so it was just an amazing thing that I wanted to share, a small victory. You know, it's small. You know, we're not the biggest of places. There's cities that are larger, have a larger population than what's going on in the county of Travis. It was incredibly heartwarming to see so many people, including those that I knew were currently experiencing homelessness. When we had that meeting, we went out the next week. I went out and I met one of those people who had given the testimony and he came up to us say, thank you so much for advocating for us and for being there. And it was really awesome to see. And I thanked him for the same because he gave his testimony as being a person that's actively experiencing homelessness as an artist, trying to create art and sell that art in order to try to get some kind of life for himself as he's been homeless for at least about three years now. I've known him. It was so exciting. I was just like, yes. But I just got this email just a couple of days ago. And it was just one of those things where it's like, I can't believe it. You know, (laughs) the power of people and whatever, you know, gushy stuff you wanted to put onto it. But that's huge. You talk about it it being, you know, a small step, but just people experiencing homeless to suddenly have mobility throughout the city is huge. Getting to appointments, healthcare, housing, you know, mental health, sobriety, whatever they're dealing with. The ability mm-hmm. to have that mobility and not have to plan to walk everywhere. For miles at a time. And as I said, like for Prop B, people have moved further off the radar. So we used to go straight to the downtown area at I-35 in a central area. But now we go much further south. We go into the wooded areas around different parks, you know, different areas around. I won't put too much detail out there in this medium, but... We've had to go out pretty far to find folks that were so scared the little that they had would be taken away at the drop of a hat because of Prop B and not have anything else. They would just have to rebuild the little bit that they just got taken away from them and be no closer to getting into a housing assignment or to get shelter. It is heartbreaking. And we hear those stories from people, you know, they got a tent and they're out here, you know, minding their own business, but law enforcement came through and they were allowed to take everything they could carry and everything else. Well, that gets trashed. So they just have to take what they can carry and move out of the way. They're forced to move from that location. Everything's trashed. And then that's just it. I understand why people have gone further and further out and we we try to meet them where they are because that's what we're about. And we put in that effort to go find folks out there as much as we can to, in our limited budget that we have to serve people in general, we make that effort to do so. It would be incredible. Even the stopgap of being able to get passes every single month, that would be incredible, just over the moon for some people to not to have that worry as we get towards this longer term, a permanent solution by the Capital Metro Board. It's just awesome news that you don't get much of, you know, there's, you got to take it where you can find it. <laughs> and that's, yeah. that's definitely one of those for me. Now, we had talked about the bus passes before, not this new development and the success with City Hall, but it seemed like you had an avenue that people could donate for a month-long bus pass. Do I remember that right? Yeah. So if anyone goes to our website, if you search Austin Atheist Helping the Homeless, or it's Austin AHH, but that's a little difficult to remember. So atheist.help, what I tell people, just atheist.help, and that gets you to the site where you can click on the donate button. And since we get them half off, each bus pass only costs about $20 or so to do for an individual to have a month long pass. But even beyond that, being able to get water. So during this summer, we provided extra like gallon jugs of water, particularly for those living away from the city center who didn't have access to water because it was so hot. It was so hot 
in Texas. It's 100 degrees day after day after day out there. And it was another one of those issues where we, as organizations, had sent in concerns to Capital Metro, and they actually relented in August to give free bus travel if you said you were going to a cooling center, for example. And that was active during August and September. And now that's expired because now it's a little bit cooler. Now we're in the 90s. So that's not quite as bad, I guess. <laughs> but yeah, if you visit, you know, atheist.help or search Austin Atheist Help in the Homeless, uh, there's a donate link at the top that you can press for water, for special issues like that. We have winter issues that are going to be coming up. And so we'll be looking to get those knitted hats out there, to get gloves out there, to get thermal socks out there. Socks are big in general, to be clear. But during the winter time, having a little more to bundle up, especially on your extremities, uh, that's going to be exposed the most to the cold makes all the difference. We're in Texas, but we do get cold here. And so we'll be bringing out the hot chocolate and other things as things start to cool down and transition. And then, but that's it's always a huge help. Anything that someone wants to donate to the community group, because it's it goes right out to about 200 people every single month. We go find them and make sure they get some help and have a little bit of hope. That's what that bus travel did. Every time we do that, you can see the relief flush over people's faces. They see that it's a month long because most people think it's a day pass because that's what they're used to if they get something. It's like just a little day pass, nothing big. But when they see that it's for 31 days, they can fully understand it and you see it right there in their faces. And it's hard to describe without you being there in person. But all of my volunteers that have been new that see that face, that they know what that is and they know how powerful it is to have that access to transportation worry-free for the next month. We gave we gave them out in September of this year. We gave out the passes, but in October's giveaway on October 2nd, I had, we just had a couple, like we always, I always carry a couple just in case there's something special or an individual that's new, that's out there that needs a little additional help. And there was one young lady, she lived in the far South Austin. So this was getting like past 290 and 35. So going, you know, fairly South and she was brand new on the streets. And we were talking, having a conversation. We had cold Kool-Aid cause it was hot outside and we're just having a conversation and she was you know talking about you know you know she's homeless but she you know she wanted to look better and so she was able to get like little pieces of uh makeup and she put on like you know some a, a little bit of eyeshadow or something like that to try to to look better and she was explaining that you know she's recently got to that situation and she's still trying to navigate her way trying to figure out what to do but she was feeling very down on herself because she just did not like the way her life had turned out. And that made her feel a little better to have a little makeup. And she was just, it was a heartbreaking yeah. thing to hear as you, as you hear, the, you know, someone just pouring out their story. And so I had one pass remaining and I gave it to her and she almost broke down crying at the table, like right there in front of us, because she, oh. she was like, I did, I had no idea how to even go about this or where to go about getting something like this. And she was just, she was over the moon for two seconds and it you could see the joy and the hope that it brought her to have that little bit to her, even though she's lost so much, you could really see how much that changed. It doesn't solve her situation of experiencing homelessness at the point, but it raises her spirit. It's empowerment like you wouldn't believe. It really makes a difference out there on the streets. It just is so yeah. overwhelming. Like, oh. Yeah, that was, hers yeah. was... Mm. Yeah. yeah, you do great work, Phil. Well, but I mean, it's not what's overwhelming is just the magnitude, I guess, of the need. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, and it, I, yeah. Go ahead. No, oh. I, I think to myself, it, you know, everybody sort of has, I guess, their niche where they contribute in ways that they can, or uh, you know, a lot of people do. Mm -hmm. um, you definitely are putting yourself in situations on the street where it's like so severely needed, and. I try to give a platform to that. I donate as I can. And I just, it, it just, like I say, it just seems so overwhelming that, especially with housing being what it is mm -hmm. and the level of societal acceptance, I guess, of homelessness, of just seeing it as inevitability rather than something that needs to be solved. That's a really good point because 
it was a really shocking thing to me when I first moved to the Austin area. And this has been like over 20 years ago that I moved back to Central Texas. Before that, I had lived, you know, in Colleen. I had lived in the Dallas Fort Worth area, and then I had lived in Indiana. And in none of those places did you see the the level of homelessness that you see in Austin. And there's a lot of reasons for that. But I think the thing that was really shocking was, yeah, the general acceptance of it. Tracy, you and I were having a conversation about this that I think it was on a Sunday we were walking around Town Lake with Jenna. And we were talking about the homelessness that we were seeing out there. And it's like, this is a policy choice. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be this way. In this country, we have enough money. We could solve this problem. But you know, we make a choice not to. Yeah, we spend money on a lot of things. Yeah. Right. That prioritization, people do look at as a uh, inevitability. And when you look in online forums or when, you know, stories pop up when I'm on Facebook and I just, you know, I like to look at comments to see what people, you know, how people are reacting. You know, the police come in and sweep an area, you know, what what's the response to that when the police put it out there as if it's this wonderful thing? The city of Austin put something out on their page where it was kind of like praising, like, oh, yeah, we came out here and we cleared all of this. And some people got housing. That was kind of the the big thrill of it. But it, it was made to say, like, oh, this is something that you should be proud of when it's like a certain amount of people got housing. What happened to the rest mm-hmm. yeah. of those people? What happened to their property? Exactly. But yeah. you didn't mention that. That wasn't a part of the art. That, that, that wasn't exciting. That wasn't happy. And you mentioned Town Lake. We actually went out there to Town Lake quite a bit after Prop B was enforced. A lot of people shifted onto that trail that goes around Town Lake. So this is between Town Lake and the Creek softball complex. So right there on Pleasant Valley, we canvassed all up and down there as people were trying to live their lives and trying to figure out what they were going to do next because they they were there moving from somewhere else. And then... We got notified when we went out there one month that they put up signs they're going to come through and enforce Prop B on mm-hmm. this whole area and remove us. And I ended up making a special trip out there to give out bus passes to everyone that I could find. And while I was doing that kind of going person to person up that trail, there was an individual that was there who was actively working. And so there was like a small uh, trailer truck, like a U-Haul trailer, like the, the small one that you kind of hitch to another vehicle. And he was like, well, that's actually from my boss. So his boss bought him that, dropped it off there so he can put everything that he can in there. And his boss was going to take him to another location to set up camp somewhere else. This is an individual, this is an African-American man. Like he was like in his high thirties or so, not too, too old, very able-bodied out there. It was on the lake. That's where he got his water. That's where he uh, washed up. Everything, he showed me all of that down there where he cooks and everything. But he was fortunate that he had a supervisor, a boss in this case, that was willing to give him that because otherwise he would have had to leave a lot of his cookware and a lot of the things that he's accumulated behind like everybody else Mm -hmm. was going to have to. I gave him a bus pass and, you know, we talked a little bit about the enforcement and, you know, he had made his peace with it. But he was just trying to figure out where he was going to go. Like, where was he going to tell his boss to drop me off so I can unload this stuff and make up a new camp somewhere else? That's just the reality that he was looking at. But he has a job. He's working. He's doing what those people in the Facebook comments say. Well, that's what you need to do. Go get a job. He doesn't make enough to afford rent around where he works. So he didn't have access to the bus because he couldn't afford it because that that's quite a expense if you're paying $41.25, which is the full price of a month-long bus pass. He couldn't afford that. So he's making a little bit of money trying to save it to do something with it to improve the situation eventually. But on the way, he just has to remain homeless the whole time. And I think that's something interesting to think about. If you can't afford $41 for a month-long bus pass, how are you going to afford rent in Austin? He just had to walk to work. That's just what he did. Mm -hmm. And his boss knew his situation. So if his shoes weren't in the best of shape, the boss was aware. And that's awesome that there's a person that was willing to be empathetic to that situation and sympathetic, should I say, to what's actually happening. But how many places do that? 
it's a heck of an uphill battle. So I hope that securing transit access, if that actually is done in the systemic way that we're hoping for, can make that uphill climb just a little bit more shallow. In a country where this is what we tolerate, can we really be trusted to take care of a bunch of new babies that we're going to force to be born? <laughs> right? We can't even take care of the people that we have. We, we can't even guarantee housing to every citizen. We can't guarantee food, housing, clothing, just a basic standard of existence to the citizens that we now have, and they want to force birth more. We need a lot more poor people to work in the factories, right? Even if they're living on the river. I ran across a piece of information not that long ago that I wanted to share. And this comes from the Institute on Taxation and Economic Policy. So it's itep.org. Mm -hmm. You can go there and look up this information. Take a wild guess at who pays a higher tax rate, Texas or California? Texas. H higher tax rate? I mean, well, overall tax? It seems like California with the state tax. Don't they have a state tax, if I'm not mistaken? They do have a state income tax. Ah. And they pay property taxes and all kinds of stuff. But if you look at the tax rates, it depends on what income bracket you're in. Mm. In California, the bottom 20% of taxpayers pay 10.5% compared to the bottom 20% in Texas who pay 13% of their income in taxes. Oh, wow. In California, the middle 60% pay 8.9% compared to 97 in Texas. And if you're in the top 1%, in California, you pay 12.4% of your income in taxes. But in Texas, you pay 3.1%. So let that sink in for a minute. The top 1% of earners in Texas are paying, well, less than a fourth of the amount of taxes as the bottom 20% as a percentage of income. Of course, Texas passed a constitutional amendment banning an income tax. So in order for any future legislature to enact some kind of progressive income tax plan, they would have to first repeal that constitutional amendment in Texas. And you got so many people in Texas who are convinced income tax is theft and it's the worst thing ever. So they will, will vote against their own interests just to avoid paying an income tax. And think of what we could do with all that money, because there's an awful lot of really wealthy people in Texas who would end up contributing a boatload of income that could be used to fund a lot of resources in Texas, including things like universal pre-K. We could have universal health insurance for minors in Texas. If you're the party that is pushing forced birth. You've had plenty of time to be preparing an infrastructure for this. Right. You've had plenty of time to show how serious you are about mm -hmm. really looking after children and families, how really family focused you are. Where is that free child care, that free yeah. pre-K? Where is fixing public education? Where is universal basic income? Where is housing everybody? Where is making sure people have access to adequate food? Where is the demonstration of the commitment to the citizens that you're going to create to make sure that they are well cared for? It's just mm. not there. Right. Mm. Show me just how pro-life you are. For all these people that are living, what you going to do? It's really clear that their, their goal is making things as desperate and miserable as they possibly can and convincing people that anything else will rob them of their liberty and preying on their worst impulses just so they can stay in power. So I literally saw incumbent Republicans running ads. In one case, it was about the horrible increase in our murder rate. Mm -hmm. And they're saying, you need to reelect me. Wait, so we've got GOP leadership. You're a GOP person. You're saying that you can influence this situation. And it's gotten worse on your watch. Right. And you want me to reelect you. And in another case, they said that our border is the most dangerous border in the nation. And I thought, again, you're the incumbent. Yeah. And you're telling me not to elect a different person, not to elect Beto, because Beto can't handle the most dangerous border in the nation. And it's like, it's the most dangerous border on your watch. Yeah. 
I don't understand the Republicans who are already in power in Texas are running on a platform of how shitty the state is. Mm-hmm. And one of the commercials talks about all of the thousands of pounds of fentanyl that was intercepted at the border. And this is Joe Biden's fault. Why? And the fact that it was intercepted at the border, right. by definition, means it did not get into the country. <laughs> right. It, it's like, number one, they caught it, which is what yeah. they're supposed to do. But the other thing that killed me was when you looked at the solution, because I saw that ad. The yeah. solution they're offering is, you know, stiffer penalties, putting more judges in office who are going to be harder asked on these, you know, drug situations. And I thought to myself, you're shutting the barn door after the cows are gone. The problem yeah. here is there's a demand for this stuff. Yeah. It's not going to stop. It's just going to get more expensive the more risky you make getting it into the country. People are just going to charge more for it. But the problem here, and it is a problem because fentanyl is killing people, right? right? So this isn't just like some harmless drug where they're, you know, drumming up controversy. I mean, this is literally killing people right. and it's coming in because people want it. Mm-hmm. And if you have a demand for a dangerous drug in your country, the solution is not to ignore the demand Mm-hmm. that is like bringing it here, you've got a market for it. That's the problem. You don't address it by simply locking people up and whipping people. Yeah. You have to figure out why people want to take this drug that is so dangerous. What is motivating this market? And you need to fix it there. And it's the same thing with their gun situation. Mm-hmm. This whole school shooting thing. You need to look at the causes. And there is data on this. Johns Hopkins has a really great bunch of data that they have been amassing for decades, along with other countries to like talk about gun violence and the motivations and what they call evidence-based solutions, because they know what solutions will work and what solutions won't work. It's not like this has never, ever been tried or tested or that you don't have any metrics here. We do. But what's happening is they've got the gun debate completely derailed on weird issues like, you know, mental health. Well, that's great if you want to focus on, you know, suicide gun death. Yeah, let's have that conversation if you want to reduce suicides. People are killing themselves with guns, committing suicide. That is the number one way that people die with a gun is killing themselves. Mm -hmm. And after that, it's like people being murdered. (laughs) This whole conversation around when we talk about something like a school shooting, these didn't exist when I was a kid and now they exist. So let's have a look. And the answer is not we took prayer out of school, right? That's that is not. okay. so let's really look at the evidence. Let's look at the data. Let's get Johns Hopkins in here. Let's pull all of these researchers in who have looked at this for the last 20 years and have pulled together actual policy statements that explain this and free courses online that you can go and take to learn what the data actually says about this and deal with it. But their whole method of dealing with everything is just punish people after the fact. Well, and they have no plans to mitigate these problems by preemptively looking at the causes and actually making the causes go away. Because what Texas really needs is a, a larger prison population, right? Well, it's, right. It's, it's, it's lucrative. They yeah. have every reason to want a huge prison population in this state. Yeah. yeah. If anybody doesn't know, there's actually a financial incentive to keep people, especially juveniles, incarcerated for as long as possible in Texas. It is, in my mind, one of the most deeply immoral things this state has ever done. And that is saying a lot for Texas. I mean, it's so hard to even have that conversation, honestly, with people that are in power. Like when you have private prisons and others that have money and lobbyists at their leisure to be able to advocate for pushing for higher higher penalties, stiffer penalties. As you said, there's a money incentive sitting right there. I want to build a prison here and I want to fill it. So now how are we going to do that? You know, you have one group of people who are foaming at the mouth over their liberty. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, they're promoting the idea that there should be a financial incentive for depriving people of their liberty. And that tells me that anything they have to say about promoting liberty is bullshit. They don't care about that. That's a dog whistle. 
it's designed to inspire a certain group of people. Oh, if we provide sex education, we're depriving parents of their liberty by informing their children that you don't have to put yourself at risk of STIs and pregnancy. You can have a fulfilling sex life without incurring excessive risk. They don't want their kids to know that. They don't want their kids to know that the homeless people that you see walking around Austin, it wasn't their choice. It's a policy decision. We all need to own that. Somehow that's making them feel guilty and that's terrible because their feelings are much more important than someone experiencing homelessness, you know. That's one of the things I've realized recently about the concept of privilege. People have this attitude that privilege is some sort of accidental thing and asked to be born white. I was just born white. It's not my fault. And they don't ask themselves, why is white a privileged position? This isn't some accident of nature. This is social engineering, right? We've socially engineered a white supremacist society so that people who are born white have advantages. And we've socially engineered a sexist society where people who are assigned AFAB have to fight for their rights. And I had a friend say to me recently, people who are assigned female at birth so we can impress half the population. I was like, you know, you're right. It really seems like that's the goal here, that these gender assignments are just another way to slice and dice people yeah. to say the, this group is the in-group, this group is the out-group, this group is the dominant culture. They own and control this other group. Born wealthy, wealth disparity, wealth inequity. Why does that exist in the society? Why do we have that? When you understand that even though you don't choose where you're born, we do choose to perpetuate a society that allows people to be born with advantages over other people because of the way we've engineered the society as hierarchical. It doesn't have to be like that. It just is because we made it that way and we keep keeping it that way. I just finally began to realize like, oh, there's a disconnect here with some folks that don't understand that privilege does obligate you. Because when you have the advantage, you have it because someone else has been socially engineered to have a social disadvantage. So it's not the advantage comes at no cost to someone else. You can't have mm -hmm. an advantage over other people unless they have a disadvantage with regard to you. When I live in a society that is engineered to give me this unfair advantage that I was born with, I have to look at that and say, well, that means that the other group, that's the not me group, was born unfairly into this disadvantage because of that same social structure that is an artifice that we create and perpetuate. And so the question becomes, now that I'm aware of this, do I continue to perpetuate this unfair marginalization of this other person who just happened to be born in the crap position compared to me? Do I keep exploiting that to my advantage and their disadvantage, doing harm to them so that I can do well? Or do I decide that it's unfair and I can't continue to do well at a cost to them and this has to get fixed? And so I have some work to do because I'm the one in the power position with more access to the levers to be able to adjust the structure and to push back on it. This person is disempowered. That to me is the switch that isn't flipping for some folks in their heads with regard to understanding privilege. Yeah, I see too many defensive reactions to people who, I hate to stereotype, but it's almost always cishet white males who are reacting defensively because they think, oh, well, I wasn't that privileged. I had to struggle or whatever. And that's not what it's about. I get that you may have had to struggle, but it wasn't because you were white. It wasn't because you're male. It wasn't because you're cisgender or heterosexual or any of those things. Everybody struggles at some point in their life, unless you're Elon Musk or something. Um, yeah, then you just struggle with how to stay relevant. <laughs> what obnoxious crap can I say to keep myself controversial this week? Or how to buy Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever. Yeah. Well, and you know, the Ukrainians, I mean, they'd be totally fine if they just rolled over and let Russia just have half of Eastern Ukraine. <laughs> Um, speaking, yeah, of of, speaking of, speaking of, speaking <laughs> of, I've got a shout out to, if you're not following the official Ukrainian Twitter, you at least need to stop by that thing and read it every now and then because they treat the war almost like a football game. 
I say this with respect, but it's almost like a parody of a national Twitter account. They're goading Russia. It is, it is unbelievable. The dark humor in it. Well, and like, one, one of the responses when somebody from Russia was saying, oh, we know the Ukrainians are responsible for this. Look what you've done. And I think somebody from Ukraine tweeted back, sick burn. Yeah, it's it's <laughs> wild to me that this is like a country, an official country's Twitter. I don't know who's in charge of it, but it's they're, they're getting lots of mad respect from Twitter. And it is definitely something to, to read. I wonder sometimes what would happen if more countries had Twitter accounts like that. Like, would it be great or would it be scary? But I find them funny. You know, since you brought up Ukraine, I, I'll just comment that as a retired army officer, I'm looking at this thinking this whole military campaign that Ukraine has waged, it's fucking awesome. This is the kind of stuff that from now until probably a century from now, maybe beyond, military officers are going to read about these battles. They're going to dissect the tactics there and they're going to learn from this. We're watching history being written here as far as, you know, military tactics and the things that Ukraine's doing. And Putin basically instituted a draft. So they've had hundreds of thousands of young potential draftees flee Russia. And two of them sailed across the Bering Sea into Alaska like a week ago. These two Russians got to Alaska and presented themselves to officials and turned themselves in and requested asylum. I haven't heard anyone on the right claiming that we should immediately deport these two. I was about to say they're probably mm-hmm. white, so it's okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, my thing is, it's like, okay, if, if you got two Russians who sailed over to Alaska and, and basically entered the country illegally, which is, wake up guys, it's a misdemeanor, a criminal offense here. It's just a misdemeanor. You get a ticket basically and a summons that says, show back up in immigration court at this date and time. They just didn't want to be drafted into the Russian army and be forced to serve in Ukraine. And if you're on the right and you have no problem with that, but you got a problem with people crossing our southern border because the gangs are running rampant in their home country and they just right. they want their kids to survive childhood. Right. Mm-hmm. But you don't have a problem with two Russians presenting themselves in Alaska. You got to ask yourself why that is. And of course, the obvious answer is the guys from Russia are probably white. Just to kind of throw this one out there, because this is really interesting. So DeSantis, when he orchestrated the handful of immigrants that he sent to Martha's Vineyard, it was immigrants from Venezuela. Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, guess who's coming to Florida to work cleanup and (laughs) rebuild? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Immigrants from Venezuela. For people that are not aware, until fairly recently, Texas has historically been very fuzzy about undocumented immigrants. There were allegedly raids on restaurants and stuff like that, but a lot of them got tipped off ahead of time, or they were loudly announced as they walked in the front door of the restaurant that, you know, it's immigration or whatever, Mm -hmm. so that the undocumented folks could run out the back door and not get caught. None of the businesses that hired the undocumented immigrants were ever fined or punished in any way. And it's because the wealthy business owners who employed all these undocumented immigrants paid into the campaigns of certain politicians who then made sure that the laws looked the other way. But as soon as it became a political hot potato to be cruel to undocumented immigrants, suddenly it's an invasion on our southern border and we have to lock them all up. And they wonder why we have so many job openings and businesses are going under because they can't find people to work. Yeah. And I just want to be clear to folks that our immigration policy in the United States has always been hot trash. We have never had good immigration. So if somebody comes at you and says Biden is really sucking at immigration, don't try to argue that he's not because there's never been a president in the United States who didn't suck at immigration. They all suck at immigration. The point is it was no better when a Republican was in office, right? Immigration has just Mm -hmm. been a hot mess forever for every president. So no one does good. And yes, I have seen people attack Particular things, for example, that have happened because of Republicans in Texas and Florida, that if they look at the federal level, Biden has done things that are very similar. 
and been renounced for it by organizations like the UN calling for you know, ceasing particular policies that we do at the federal level. So don't feel like you have to defend Biden's immigration policy. You really don't. It's fair to say it's garbage, but that doesn't justify Texas also being garbage and Florida also being garbage. And the entire immigration mess needs to be fixed. It needs to be less racist. It needs to be more compassionate and humane. Don't get into trying to defend anybody on immigration because the, there really isn't any good immigration policy in the U.S. and never has been. And to be clear, I am not defending. Right. No, and I, I understand it. I just don't want people to feel, yeah, I don't want I, them to fall into that trap because if yeah. they start opening their mouth, they're going to find out right away that there's a lot of crap that happens at the federal level that is not pretty. I'm just saying that it wasn't always this big political issue that right-wingers are using as evidence that, oh, we've got to lock down our borders, we have to build this wall, or we've got an invasion coming through. And it's like, no, you know, you didn't think it was an invasion when this was just a group of people that you were willing to exploit. You know? Yeah, I mean, this is this is how it works, right? I probably have mentioned this a lot. So if people listen to the podcast, they probably heard this speech before. But in my neighborhood, right, you can go on Nextdoor, the neighborhood app, and there will be people complaining about immigration. And then I can take you and walk through the neighborhood and we can look at crew after crew after crew putting on a new roof, mm -hmm. doing somebody's cutting down limbs and doing their yard work. A house is being renovated and there's all kinds of construction going on inside. And every one of those crews are brown people. And we could go walk up to any one of those crews and start talking to them. They won't understand a word we're saying because not one of them speaks English except for the crew manager who may or may not be on site. But that's the person that speaks English. And so that's the person you're going to deal with. You're not going to deal with these other folks. They're not speaking English. They're not here legally. Most of them are immigrants living in a house of, with like 15 people packed. I could, I could go through the neighborhood and show you which houses because they're going to have all the work trucks parked in front of it. And you're going to be like, wow, that house must have 20 people living there. They live in the neighborhood. They work in the neighborhood. Everybody's happy to hire them and brag about what great work they do and what great prices they got and then get on next door and complain about those freaking immigrants. That's how it works. And that's what DeSantis is doing on a statewide scale right now. He's complaining about the immigrants. And now that they need help, who do you think is going there to fix it? Mm -hmm. yep. And well, as soon as they get it cleaned up, and maybe even before they get it cleaned up, they're going to be right back getting vilified again by the same man who's using them and exploiting them. And part of the problem, too, is that when they do all this work, a lot of times if somebody's unscrupulous, if you have a contractor that's not scrupulous, they'll just stiff the workers once the work is done. Because what are these people going to do? If they complain, they get deported. Right. So they have no recourse and, and they are rife for like exploitation and abuse by employers because they are afraid to report any kind of workplace abuse. Well, I need to go, guys. All right. So <laughs> we've been on yeah. two and a half hours chatting, although we haven't recorded two and a half hours. And once I get this edited down, I have no idea what the length will be, but it'll be somewhat smaller. Maybe I'm thinking an hour and a half or so. We'll see what it comes to. But I want to thank you guys for being available tonight. I want to thank you for talking about what's going on. I want to put out a call to folks to please remember to vote. It does matter. If you don't think you want to vote, hopefully you've registered. I've been promoting voter registration saying get out there, get registered. Even if you think you don't want to vote, go get registered. Even if you have given up on the federal level elections, go get registered, vote in the local elections, vote school board, because it really matters. And not a lot of people vote school board. So your vote counts more. If you don't want to vote, you know, at this point, it's a little too late. By the time this podcast comes out, I'm sure that registration deadlines will be passed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Registration deadline is tomorrow. So October 11th. I, there's no way I'll get this edited and up by tomorrow. So right. by the time this comes out, I have put out calls on social media, register, 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 even if you don't want to vote because if you get down to the wire and you decide you want to vote you can't if you're not registered you don't even have to go anywhere if you just register online to vote even if you don't want to vote on the day we're supposed to vote don't if you don't want to vote during the midterms and you're registered it costs you nothing and it doesn't hurt anything and you still don't have to vote and that's what my message has been so hopefully some folks have registered once you're registered the voting happens you don't have to vote in every election you can skip elections if only one election matters to you, if only the school board matters to you, 
you can go and vote the school board. So please just look at what's on the ballot and see if anything matters to you. If any of these positions you think are important, judges, if you think judges are important, if you think school board is important, if you think representatives are important, like any level you do think it's worth it, go down there. And even if you vote in that part of the ballot, just do it. I don't know how else to plead. Right? <laughs> well, thank you, Phil. Thank you, Jen. Any last words? No, this was great. Thank you for uh, having us on again. Yeah, you're totally welcome. Yeah. Great to touch base. I always go into these things like, oh, what, what if we don't have that much to talk about? You know, what if, <laughs> what if we don't go? Are you <laughs> kidding? We have so, then, <laughs> so many opinions. <laughs> And then it just goes. And I love that. It's really, it's really awesome. And if I wasn't so far away from y'all, I would be with y'all in person, you know, be able to hang out much more, but hang on up there. (laughs) All right. Well, thanks guys. Then have a good night. Thanks. All right. You too. That's it for this episode of At Home in My Head, exploring life in the cottage at Woodland Corners. Thanks for listening, and as always, stay safe, be well, and never stop exploring.